That was great. <laughs> so uh, uh, a change of uh, shift of gears here. Uh, Claire Chase is the flute player and founder of the International Contemporary Ensemble, otherwise known as ICE. She's a 2012 MacArthur Fellow. She's a soloist, collaborative artist, entrepreneur, and activist for new music. Over the past decade, she's given the world premieres of over 100 new works for flute, many of them tailor-made for her. And since its launch in 2001, ICE has premiered more than 600 works and pioneered a new artist-driven organizational model that earned the company a Trailblazer Award from the American Music Center in 2010. Claire was also honored with Crane's Business 40 Under 40 Award in 2013. But here's the important stuff. Claire enjoys a good single malt. She can talk your ear off about board development, and she's been setting the music world on fire. Please welcome the extraordinary Claire Chase.
Thank you. Good afternoon. Density 21.5 was written in 1936 for one of the first instruments made entirely of platinum. It was the first piece of contemporary flute music I ever heard. I was 13 years old and it completely transformed my life. I was so obsessed with it that when I was asked to play for my junior high school graduation, <laughs> I tried to convince them to program density. Now, this was the early 90s when public schools in Southern California didn't even have band programs. And here I was, this uber nerd, queer, flutistic experiment in orthodontics. I think I had as much metal on my teeth as I did on my flute. With the fantasy that I could rouse my fellow teenage comrades by wailing on Edgar Varez in a football field. I wish this were how the story went. My proposal, however, was summarily shot down, and I played a rousing rendition of Danny Boy instead. <laughs> but you know, there's nothing more emboldening to the courage of youth than being told that you can't do something you really, really want to do. And so this derailed attempt lit a fire in me that blazes to this day, the fire to tell a different kind of story. And as a seeker of sounds for this little tube of metal, I dream that by 2036, the 100th anniversary of the piece, I will have commissioned or had a helping hand in giving birth to a work that, like density, shakes the very foundations of what we know and instantly propels us into a new century of possibility. Salman Rushdie, one of my favorite storytellers and activists, said recently, we need all of us, whatever our background, to constantly examine the stories inside which and with which we live. We all live in stories, so-called grand narratives. He went on, nation is a story, family is a story, religion is a story, community is a story. We all live within and with these narratives and a definition of any living, vibrant society is that you constantly question those stories. Density 21.5 is a story. Contemporary music is a story. Classical music is a story. The new music band is a story. The orchestra, too, is a story. The segregation of our creative practices into buckets that we call organizations, departments, boards, bands, unions, these are also stories. We're gathered at this conference to speak together about the future of American orchestras, a subject it might be the least qualified person in this room to address since I have created a life in music that challenges much of what the institution has embodied for the last half century. But I have reverence and boundless curiosity for the orchestra as an evolving art form for its vast and ever-expanding repertoire, past, present, and future, and for the palpable utopia of 100 people coming together with one common purpose. Although I have no solutions to offer, I am honored to have the opportunity to tell you a different story today. The same year that he composed Density, Varez wrote that music which should pulsate with life, needs new means of expression. Density ignited much more than a search for the next great flute solo. It marshaled in me a desire for new vehicles of expression and for an engine to drive them. It unleashed a curiosity about creating new economies, collaborative models, and definitions of community that could also pulsate with life. I imagined if four minutes of music could do what density did for me, what might happen if a group of young artists came together to create new music for ensembles large and small, as pioneers seeking new instruments, technologies, performance practices, 
and new ways of hearing and distilling our world? What new story could unravel if a whole generation of artists tried to expand the ways that we created music using these ideas? What if we did it with the spirit of invention rather than preservation, and with change rather than convention as our guides? As a junior at Oberlin in 1999, I got curious about how I might make this happen. It was the end of a century, and that seemed like a good time to explore Ferez's vision of new expressive means. I assembled 15 of my Oberlin classmates to commission a program of new works in celebration of the year 2000, and moreover to create a scene, a happening, around their world premiere performances. Somehow, I'm not really sure how, we got permission to use Oberlin's 750-seat concert hall for this occasion. And most of the new music concerts that I'd been to up until that point had a few dozen people at them, and one of them was my uncle, who was wearing earplugs, and you know, says, God, Claire, why can't you just play the Poulenc Sonata? <laughs> well, we, we wanted this to be different. We wanted to pack that hall with young people, with old people, people from school, people from town, people who loved new music, and just as important, people, people who thought they hated new music. And to do this, we needed to look at every decision as a creative decision, whether it was about marketing, fundraising, budgeting, education, production, outreach, where to put the chairs at the concert, or how to get people on and off stage in between pieces. There was no decision that wasn't creative. Marketing, which is really just storytelling, is intrinsically connected to curation and programming. Education and community building are just natural outgrowths of a burning need to perform, to make music for people, to tell them stories. It took all year, but we did it. That night in April 2000, Warner Concert Hall was standing room only. And for a brief moment, we felt like anything, absolutely anything was possible. We were about to graduate into a world with dwindling job opportunities for classical, let alone contemporary musicians. And we had this nutty idea that in the face of all kinds of adversity, we could create a new kind of organization, part 21st century orchestra, part rock band, circus troupe, nonprofit startup, in search of new expressive means in our artistic practices and in our organizational ones. We didn't imagine having one concert hall as a home base. We wanted to be mobile, modular, light on our feet. We could be a duo one night and a cast of hundreds the next. We didn't want to exist in just one city. We wanted to be everywhere. We could play in a black box theater one night, the back of a pickup truck the next. But we also didn't want to recycle the touring model and offer one-stop shop reenactments. We wanted to build meaningful relationships with audiences in each place. And we wanted our repertory to be constantly growing, pulsating with life. So we decided that we'd have local outposts in Chicago and New York, with the eventual idea of setting up similar satellites on the West Coast, in Latin America and Europe, a museum in Qatar, a warehouse in Berlin, a boat on Lake Baikal, a school in Greenland, Hogwarts, a spaceship, the moon, even. Verez wrote beautifully, this is one of my absolute favorites, that possible musical forms are as limitless as the exterior forms of crystals. The same can be said then of organizational forms and the forms of community, economy, placemaking, and patronage. When we didn't have the faintest idea how to fundraise, we put together ragtag festivals in Chicago and bars and galleries on budgets amassed from hundreds of modest donations, five, 10, 50 bucks each. And we watched our audience and contribution numbers practically double at every event, growing from a $500 startup to a $1 million organization over 10 years. When we learned that record companies weren't going to offer us an ethical and efficient means of disseminating our music, we created our own in-house label so that we, the artists, could own our own music and decide what to do with it. When we discovered that none of our local 
public schools in Brooklyn and Chicago had music programs. We created curricula based on improvisation, play, discovery, the same principles that fueled our own music making. Being a musician is being a teacher, and we need to do both in order to authentically do either one. When we were frustrated with the lack of commissioning funds for emerging composers, particularly for artists of color and composers working at the risky crossroads of different disciplines, we started a program, Ice Lab, so that the ice musicians could fund, administer, and curate a body of repertoire by the brightest voices in our generation. When we saw that the Berlin Philharmonic had created a state-of-the-art digital concert hall, we asked ourselves how we could create an American, do-it-yourself, public service version of that on a sliver of their budget. So we launched Digitice, our very own virtual concert hall that's rapidly becoming one of the world's largest video archives of contemporary music. And now as we view the demise of the subscription ticket model and other things that the news characterizes as the death of classical music. We're even more fired up. We're imagining the kind of story we want to tell in our second decade, and we're creating a new program, Open Ice, a kind of 21st century improvisation on the public library that combines crowdsourced funding, education and performance, production and curation, live and online events, all free and open to the public. Our goal is to reach a million people annually with contemporary music by 2020. Now, all along, it's been the ice musicians, not managers, not market forces, that have been in the driver's seat of every one of these innovations. And as we learned in our earliest experiments at Oberlin, if the most creative people are artists, why not engage them as the engines of the organization, the necessary agitators of change? Where did we ever get this idea that there are people who are creative, who are on stage, who do things, and then people behind the scenes who enable them. Isn't it time we challenged that binary? At ICE, our, our bassoonist, our rock star bassoonist, Rebecca Heller, is running development alongside our new saxophonist, Ryan Muncy. Our brilliant percussionist, Ross Carr, is running production. Our fabulous pianist, Jacob Greenberg, directs education programming. Our visionary clarinetist, Joshua Rubin, co-directs artistic programming. And they do these hybrid jobs because they see them as deeply creative enterprises. Like music making, these organizational projects come of a place of curiosity, generosity, and love. But the story isn't about ice. We are just one grain of sand in a landslide of startup momentum. Consider peer groups like New Amsterdam, which single-handedly reimagined what a record label could be, dissolving needless barricades between programming, producing, disseminating. A far cry, which is spearheading a second-generation Orpheus model, stands on Orpheus's shoulders but takes the idea of collective ownership even, even further. Meet the Composer, a groundbreaking new radio show masterminded by Nadia Sirota, a kind of new music radio lab, is set to launch at the end of this month on Q2 Music. There's also Wild Up in Los Angeles, Doniente in Chicago, and a hundred, soon to be thousands of others brewing. And for all of these groups, the division of artist and administrator, composer and performer, practitioner and producer, self-made organization and public asset, new music and old music even. These are old, tired stories. You know, people thought I was stark raving mad when I said a decade ago that new music ensembles will have an indispensable place alongside other great American cultural institutions, opera companies, theaters, orchestras, baseball teams. But you know what? That fire is now blazing and unstoppable. And it's no longer about ICE and our peers, or even about our generation. It's now about the generation younger than we are, the ones I constantly tell to please, please put me out of business. While you're at it, please go ahead and put new music out of business. Isn't it time we called it something else and told an even newer story? 
And please play better than we do. Please innovate with more velocity, with more fire. Please teach with greater knowledge than we have amassed. Please think of solutions we haven't thought of. Returning to Rushdie, a definition of any living, vibrant society is that you constantly question these stories. He went on to say that you constantly argue about the stories. In fact, the arguing never stops. The argument itself is freedom. It's not that you come to a conclusion about it. You change your mind sometimes. And that's how societies grow. All of us, on stage, off stage, playing in pickup trucks and in opera pits, programming in concert halls and in stadiums, running startups and running monoliths. We're the authors of our own stories. And it's our responsibility, indeed our great privilege, to have our minds changed by each other's arguments. If you don't believe that the generation younger than ICE is, is filled with optimism, I invite you to the ICE inbox. We get emails daily from students who argue courageously about these stories. They say, I want to start a band, a composer collective, a label, a school, an orchestra. I want to make a kind of music no one has made before. I want to spearhead a disruptive organizational model no one has thought of yet. They're about to graduate, if we're lucky, if we, if we do it right, into the ranks of our so-called symphony orchestras and our so-called contemporary music ensembles. And who knows, perhaps the orchestra and the new music band won't need to be such separate entities this century. Could that binary dissolve too? The word orchestra, ancient Greece, meant a dancing place. What if orchestras of the 21st century could revisit this most ancient part of their stories and be literally an open space? A place where change is the norm, where even the permanent collection, what we call our canon, is questioned, argued, retold. A place that commissions twice as much new music as it repeats and reaches twice as many school children as it reaches patrons or a place where the sphere of context, the very notion of public, is constantly widening. A place where the radical reimagination of how and for whom art gets made is a daily practice. The orchestra as a dancing place, a space that houses musicians not as interpreters, but as catalysts for change, that inspires administrators to be alchemists, synergists, and welcomes audience members not as consumers, but as participants in a dialogue about our pulsating art form and its newest expressive means. This brings us back to Varese. Possible musical forms are as limitless as the exterior forms of crystals. As luminous as this vision is, even Verez's ideas can't stay new forever. But his fervent invitation to widen the spaces of our imaginations can feed our energy the same way that the vast, varied musical ecology of 2014, from garage bands to symphony orchestras to, importantly, new creative and organizational entities we don't have names for yet, forges a clearing for our current dancing place. That last plaintive high B in Density 21.5 isn't an ending to a story. It's a beginning. It's not a proclamation. It's an inquiry. And I hope that inquiry will never, ever stop unfolding, never finish arguing with itself, and never cease unraveling into new questions and new stories. Thank you.